afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining us here today at the Internet Gaming. Today's accepting this topic. Uh, I'm Nick Farley, I'm president of the Clip Compliance Testing out of Solon, Ohio. We're a regulatory compliance testing laboratory. Uh, this is Ken Golda, he's a business consultant with Eclipse. Uh, that's a little bit about myself. That's a little bit about yourself. Go ahead. Um, I've been in the industry for a little over 11 years. Uh, I've worked with uh, all three of the different independent testing laboratories. So I definitely have a testing aspect now, Pat. I also uh, worked with Gaming Informatics for about a year prior to uh, consulting with Eclipse, um, where I was the vice president of business development for them. They're really good regulatory products. Um, in my background, I was a director of technical compliance at BMN, um, as well as a senior engineer at, at GLI, uh, responsible for a lot of the system testing and protocol testing that went on. So, yeah. Okay. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm president of Eclipse. I've been in the gaming industry for just over 24 years. Began my career with the New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement in Atlantic City as an engineer in their test laboratory. Uh, worked there for four years, and then went to work for what was at the time a startup company, uh, Gaming Laboratories International. Worked there for nine years, rose to the level of senior management as their executive director of special projects. Uh, helped them open up offices in Australia and South Africa, and other places on the globe, and uh, did uh, hundreds of casino openings, did a lot of system testing, things like that while I was with them. In 2000, I uh, had a family illness that caused me to move to Ohio. Uh, my father-in-law took ill, and uh, with that, and uh, 13 years gaming experience at that time, uh, started my own business, uh, which has become Eclipse Compliance Testing, and we're now in our 11th year, uh, serving testing and consulting needs of federal regulators, manufacturers, and various industry professionals. So, okay. And, uh, Okay, well, today we have an interesting topic, at least I think so, and you guys will find it interesting as well. It's, uh, it's one of the most uh, hotly debated topics in gaming right now is internet gaming. Um, whether you're a state regulator or a tribal regulator or somewhere in between, um, it's, a, it's an area that, that has people's interest because it's an area of growth, it's an area of controversy because as we'll get into here in this, in this uh, Discussion. We'll, we'll talk about the the actual current state of internet gaming in the United States as we stand. We'll give you a little bit about uh, our company, Eclipse Compliance Testing. A little bit about the company's history. Um, we'll talk about what is internet gaming. Um, most people probably know about that, but for those who don't, we'll talk a little bit about what makes it internet gaming. Um, the state of internet gaming around the world. Where is it being used? Where is it legal? How is it regulated? Things like that. Um, how has it performed? Uh, some numbers on, on how internet gaming has performed to this point and why it's, you, you start to see why people in America are interested in, in, in having this as part of the repertoire for gaming. Um, the current state of internet gaming in the United States, uh, as it goes right now, it's currently legal. But that doesn't mean that Washington DC can't pass it. So we'll talk about that more in depth as we get going. Uh, the controversy for internet gaming, uh, some of the recent headlines that some of the major poker players get shut down. Uh, we'll talk about that, why it happened, what the charges were, things of that nature. And we'll talk about some of the uh, key jurisdictions in the United States that are actually fighting this battle right now. Washington, D.C., I mentioned, they're the first ones to pass internet gaming in the United States. Um, New Jersey and California both have bills that may be passed uh, in the next weeks and months ahead. Um, class two, how, how, how does that play a factor in, in internet gaming? Um, we'll talk about that. As well as what we're, what we're really here to talk about is current regulatory methods. What are they using around the world to handle some of the most important topics and, and, and places from a regulator's point of view that are areas of concern? So. We'll, we'll talk about that in depth, as well as some of the risks uh, that are out there for running internet gaming and how those are mitigated around the world. And uh, we'll conclude with a recommended rollout uh, rollout schedule for internet gaming. How do you do it? What, how do you do it? Baby steps? What, is that look, what does that look like? Um, so, Nick? All right. Well, we'll uh, go over a little bit of the company history if you just bear with us for a little bit. I know some of you aren't familiar with us. But um, we were founded in November 2000. 
as a partnering associates or NFA, as they were more affectionately known. Seems like the labs like to have three letter acronyms. ECT hasn't caught on yet, but Eclipse Compliance Testing is, is our trade name right now. Uh, we received our first authorized jurisdiction in February of 2002. That was the New Jersey Division, or New Jersey Legalized Game of Chance Control Commission. Uh, in 2003, we were relied upon by the National Indian Gaming Commission to help with classification determination of the bingo system. That was multimedia games, real time bingo. Uh, in 2005, as uh, the compacts were being signed in Oklahoma, uh, we became licensed by the Oklahoma Horse Racing Commission, uh, which is a very significant milestone for us. It brought us into the Oklahoma market, which is a unique market and has been a very strong market for our company. Uh, in November 2006, we moved to our current facility, which is about 11,000 square feet in Solon, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. Uh, we received uh, our, our uh, 100th jurisdiction authorization in January 2007. Currently, we're over 200 jurisdictions where we're authorized. Um, in August 2007, we rolled out our new trade name, Eclipse Compliance Testing. Um, and then in 2009, uh, we went through the arduous process of becoming ISO accredited, where we received ISO 17025 accreditation as a laboratory. Uh, we enhanced that in 2010, this last year, to add the GSA accreditation. So now we are a GSA accredited uh, testing laboratory. We also added on 17020, which is field services. Um, a couple of awards we've received in recent history. Uh, last August, I was honorably bestowed the Warrior Award by the Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association. Uh, and in December of last year, we were honored by the Weatherhead School of Management <coughs> in, in uh, Cleveland as uh, a Weatherhead 100 award recipient, one of the fastest growing companies in Northeast Ohio. So, uh, a little bit about who we are and what we're doing. All right, so what is internet gaming? How many people in this room have actually internet game? As Okay, a few it's people okay. are willing to admit it. <laughs> you know, I'm actually one of those people as well. I actually had to, when I did a background for uh, Missouri Gaming Commission, that was one of the questions they asked, and I answered truthfully. I, I did try it. I was, I was uh, researching. So, <laughs> but internet gaming is gambling through a website utilizing the internet or an intranet to connect players to participate in casino type games. Um, some of those examples of games are poker, which is the hot one. In, in North America right now. Class two games could be offered as internet type games. Class three style slot machines. Um, so like you would see in the casino, just would be a, uh, on the internet and blackjack games. And I'm sure there's more than that, but you get the idea. Um, internet gaming is, right now they're focusing on poker as being the roll rollout um, game of choice, it seems. Um, and I guess it's going to expand beyond that. Sure. Internet gaming is worldwide. Uh, it's very popular in Europe and elsewhere. Um, there are numerous locations. I want to say that there's approximately 85 countries that have some sort of regulated or legalized internet gaming around the world. We've highlighted a few of them that have some sort of regulatory scheme around them, uh, including Albany, Antigua, and Barbuda in the Caribbean, British Columbia, which recently passed it just last year. Gibraltar, Dial of Man, Malta, and coming up next year, Ontario. And there's plenty more. There's the Kahnawakis in, in New York, in Quebec, in Italy, and a few other places in Europe. But we wanted to highlight those. They seem to have uh, some sort of regulatory structure, especially all the Island Isle of Man in BC. Um, currently, internet gaming is banned in some jurisdictions as it is in the US. Australia has a limited ban where um, players are not allowed to play games based in Australia. They can only gamble on web internet sites outside of Australia. India and Russia have banned it. And of course, uh, the United States does not allow for financial transactions with banks under UIGA, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act. And, uh, you have yeah, that, that, that's really the unique landscape. It, it, is the United States put that little crimp into it where you, you can't bank. So it really, even though you can play it legally, in theory, uh, it's the whole transacting with banks that are, that, that is the illegal part. And uh, we're going to talk about it here coming up, it, why it 
how, how the federal government, the Department of Justice, recently cracked down on those and why, why it occurred and the law behind it, uh, which is right here. Well, sort of. Uh, how is it performed where it's been legal? So around the world, um, it's created quite a bit of revenue. Um, 25.8 billion from players worldwide. Um, this was probably two years ago, 2009, H2 Gaming Capital study. I couldn't find one more recent than that from last year. And 5.4 billion of those was from the United States where it's illegal. So it's quite a big chunk of change from uh, an illegal activity in the United States. Hence, you see why there's a push on to try and get some of that uh, revenue in the United States. Uh, 41 billion could be generated in taxation revenue over a 10-year period under a regulated internet. That was a, a U.S. Joint Committee on Taxation report that was done also in 2009. Uh, 41 billion dollars could pay for a lot of, make up for a lot of state shortfalls, uh, at least somewhat. Uh, in, in addition to the high revenue generated by internet gaming, effective regulation around the world has mitigated uh, security and integrity issues uh, that come along with it. So this is not something that's completely new. It's not like we're going to be creating the wheel here in North America. There is precedent and uh, there are some jurisdictions out there, as we'll talk about, that have some really good regulated, great regulatory schemes in place that mitigate a lot of these uh, potential issues that could come up with connecting games and gambling to the internet. And as, as you can see by the numbers, you know, a little bit more than 20% of the revenue estimated to be generated by internet gaming is coming here from the United States. And it's illegal. So when you, when you consider that it's illegal, if you were to legalize it to make people more comfortable with it, obviously those revenues are going to increase and uh, it could have quite significant impact. So. The current state of internet gaming in the U.S. I mean, I think as we all know, it's currently illegal. Uh, last month, we had the Black Friday for internet gaming, for internet gambling cracked down by the DOJ. Um, it kind of underscores that it's illegal here, for those of you that thought otherwise. Um, what happened on April 15th, the Department of Justice indicted the founders of Overstar, Full Tilt Poker, and Absolute Poker on charges of civil money laundering, bank fraud, and illegal gambling. The DOJ issued 76 restraining orders on bank accounts associated with those poker companies, and uh, they're seeking $3 billion in civil money laundering penalties and forfeiture. Sure. Um, the Department of Justice shut down all of the uh, internet sites and effectively froze the players' accounts. So uh, a couple of them were able to. Uh, Full Tilt Poker and Poker Stars were able to work out deals with the Department of Justice to at least allow limited access from their players and they were able to at least withdraw their funds. Uh, uh, the other one, uh, Absolute, Poker did. Absolute Poker did not have that same deal and their, their, their site is still completely up and running actually. Uh, yeah, this is a recent uh, screenshot from PokerStars.com uh, indicating that Department of Justice to shut them down, and uh, the domain name has been seen by the FBI. So, uh, but down at the bottom, it says, pursuant to an agreement between the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, independent poker stars, poker stars may use this domain name in the United States to facilitate players withdrawal funds held by poker stars. So, player, it's trying to mitigate the damage to the players. They're allowed to get their money back, but they're not allowed to gamble. So the controversy involves uh, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, um, passed in 2006, uh, made it illegal to transmit money to and from any organization involved in internet gambling. Um, basically, providers certain have gotten around that by circumventing this act um, by moving offshore and performing financial transactions with U.S. banks uh, under the guise of other tra other types of transactions, uh, uh, such as um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good example, but they'll uh, come up with a bogus term that they'll put it there that seems innocuous. It's not going to say you know gambling. It's not going to say betting. It's not going to say wagering. It won't say poker stars. It'll have something else. You know, I mean, just imagine what purchase lawn furniture. Yeah, that's what it will say. So for a long time, banks just turned a blind eye to it, even though it may have been. Uh, 
uh, obvious what was going on. Uh, but the Department of Justice stepped in, and, and the, the timing of it is curious to me because it happened um, uh, on uh, April 15th, and uh, tax day, formally. Um, but also, around that time, as we'll talk about, Washington, D.C. Uh, also passed internet gaming. So it's almost like the federal government is trying to limit competition before introducing it within the states. At least that's my my opinion on what's going on. So, just curious timing. So, while the Internet Gaming Enforcement Act, unlawful Inter Internet Gaming Enforcement Act, didn't strictly uh, for forbid Americans participating in online gambling, uh, it, that resulted in 20 million Americans participating in it. So, while it's illegal uh, for financial transactions, it didn't stop people from actually gambling. So 20 million Americans are probably half of, or it's estimated to be half of the actual total players around the world who participate in internet gaming. So it's a viable source of potential revenue for state and federal and tribal governments as a result of all that. Yeah, with the numbers that we got, when you look at 50% you know, of the total yeah. internet gaming population comes from the United States generating 20% of the revenue from internet gaming. It's, it's somewhat substantial. It, it, it's not something to be ignored. Which makes it interesting because if it's illegal and it's generating that much money, what do you do about it? And uh, the only the only analogy I can come up with is it's kind of like prohibition, you know, with alcohol. People were going to speakeasies and, and, and drinking, you know, illegally. It was still occurring. Here, here you have the same type of situation. People are still gambling on the internet, although albeit maybe it may be illegal or at least controversial. Uh, so what do you do about it? That's, that's where all, this whole thing's going, you know. The crystal ball, where is this headed? So, it has, you know, as a result, I mean, it's a really viable source of potential revenue for all forms of government, uh, including tribal governments. So, uh, if, you, if you haven't thought about it, your tribal regulator or tribal, or tribal council member, you might want to. Of course, you know, state and federal folks, uh, if, if it hasn't passed your desk, I'm sure it will in the future. So, where are we today? Who's going to win the race? Well, right now, technically, BC on paper has, has won the race to become the first U.S. jurisdiction to legalize internet gaming. Uh, Congress kind of took a nod on, on objecting to it. Their 30-day period expired. They're now in the race to, to uh, go and set up the first internet website based, out of, based out on U.S. soil, legally. Of course, all this is contentious, and who knows what's going to happen. You don't have a crystal ball, but that's where it stands today. So they're going to offer online poker and other games of chance, which is an interesting language in there. Um, when you start looking at other jurisdictions and what they're rolling out, they're always talking about poker. These guys have the caveat in there for other games of chance uh, within the boundaries of Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> With, with that language in there, it does leave the, the, the door open for traditional slot games and other types of casino style games, sports betting, sports betting and, and other types of stuff. Uh, at this point, uh, Interlot, which is based out of Greece, has won the bid and will be the operator for DC. So the wheels are in motion. Um, likely this is going to be, facilitate internet gaming in other states. We'll see how this comes along, it's kind of all new. But, I mean, we know that bill's been introduced in California, New Jersey, and Iowa uh, at various levels. And, uh, some different problems. And <clears throat> New Jersey was upset with uh, Washington, D.C. Um, beating them to the punch because they, they literally had a bill go through their assembly and legislature with resounding support through both, both of those houses. And the governor vetoed it last minute. So the Governor Christie vetoed it. Now they're working with the governor to try and work out his concerns that they have with the internet bill. But it's the same thing. It, it's it's an intranet based um, um, online solution. It's going to be poker based, right? I believe. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be within the bound, boundaries of New Jersey. So and we're, we're going to I know that's probably popping up questions in your head as far as how do you enforce that? 
Well, there is technology out there that you can enforce it. It's not perfect. Um, and we're going to talk about that. It's called geolocation so uh, software. And we'll talk about how that works and if it's actually going to solve all the problems. Yeah, my recollection on the bill for New Jersey was that um, it required financial transactions to be conducted at existing bricks and mortar facilities in the United States. So age and identity verification will be conducted by a licensed gaming facility. You would establish an account and then you'd be able to gamble within the borders of New Jersey online. So which kind of you know, it takes away a little bit of the fun for the player because they have to go to the facility and not everybody lives next to Atlantic City in New Jersey. I know that having lived there. <laughs> you know, hour drive was paying an act on some summer days with all the traffic. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a headache to go set up an account and, and to fund your account. If you're doing internet gaming, almost it's too much red tape. But that's a result of the Unlawful Internet Gaming Enforcement Act being in place is you have to have a way around it. Uh, player accounts physically being opened is how you get around that. Moving on to California, California has introduced two bills, um, which are really just proposals at this point, but uh, SB 40 and SB 45. SB 40 allows for the creation of up to three online sites initially, and the possibility to expand up to five after three years of operation with a recommendation from the Gambling, uh, California Gambling Control Commission. Um, it will allow poker, its premise is to have poker played over the internet within the borders of the state of California. Yeah, this is what is commonly being referred to as an intranet, in as much as that it can only be conducted within the borders of California. Um, it's, it, it's to be run in the same manner that card games are currently being run in card rooms and travel facilities. That's before you require the operator of online gaming to be an existing operator in California, which means that Tribes aren't necessarily cut out from participating in this activity. Uh, this, this bill has gained the support of CNIGA and COPA, um, the California Online Poker Association, as well as the California Game, Gaming Association. California Nations Gaming Association. CNIGA. Yeah. CNIGA. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that really is the one that seems to be gaining the most momentum right now in California. John Shaker said no. <laughs> one of them died. Which one? I think 40. 40? 40 died? Korea's? Yeah. It's another guy to write. Which is SP45. Yeah. And that's the one that. No, we can pull right here. Up. SP45 allows for up to up. three online intranet gaming sites, but the key part is it opens it up potentially to hub operators outside of California. <laughs> And that's the one they're going with? Yeah. Really? The problem with Wright's bill, the reason that one is to die is that he got indicted for not living in his district and some other issues about where he's making his money. But that's the only one that's like right now. Here I thought we had the latest information. This was this is fresh as of Sunday, this presentation. But it's changing. It's a it's a changing landscape. That's why we covered both of these bills because you know there there there's just a lot of controversy in California over it. And even within CNIGA, you know, the ones that supported SB40, it wasn't unanimous, certainly. And I know Morongo came out recently with some of the amendments, and they were vehemently opposing some of those amendments. Um, <clears throat> so this is the one they're apparently going to go with. Take John's word for it, he's close to it. Um, so it's going to uh, require up to three sites regulated by the California uh, Gambling Control Commission. Uh, with enforcement by, by the California Department of Justice. Um, Department of Justice would issue an RFP to enter into contracts with up to three hub operators to provide lawful internet gaming to registered players in California for a period of 20 years. Um, the hub operators would be required to remit an agreed upon percentage, but no less than 10% of its gross revenue to the treasurer on a monthly basis. There's that revenue piece that's going to fund that big shortfall they have. In, California that the governor has created. Iowa has been an interesting study for those of you that haven't followed it. Iowa introduced the bill, Senate Bill 1165. It started out as an internet poker bill. Uh, they wanted to have a, what we're calling an intranet uh, to allow poker to be uh, conducted over the internet within the, within the borders of Iowa. 
Uh, it would have required players to establish an account at a specially licensed casino, again, that age and identity verification at a special location, to establish an account. Uh, as it went through the legislature, it got watered down, and right now it's just down to a feasibility study that's going to be conducted by the Iowa Racing and Gaming Commission uh, to see if internet gaming is, is plausible and feasible in Iowa. So um, we'll wait and see. I believe that they have a deadline of December to present a report to the legislature. So class two, uh, we had a panel earlier the, the, the town hall meeting um, and it, we spent quite a bit of time on internet gaming uh, with class two. Um, and IGRA gives, gives tribes uh, the exclusive ability to conduct class two gaming on tribal lands. So uh, it, it begs the reason that class two should be a, a very significant part of the online gaming landscape. Um, I argued earlier today that, in my opinion, there, it's very difficult to ensure the security of online poker, at least the, the, um, the fairness of it, because uh, you could have five players in a room and four of them could be working against one player in the room. Right. Um, and there's no way really to regulate that. There's ways to mitigate the risk, such as uh, uh, trending, who, who plays with who, um, you know, looking at data that's been collected and trying to match, but that's an after the fact thing. And, and these, these organized crime, is the best way to describe it, it's organized crime can be in and out and gone before you even realize that, 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 that something nefarious has gone on. Most of that happened uh, in the nefarious realm of internet gaming are really reactive. In other words, there's, there's a player that's complained about something that happened. They thought that there were other players colluding against them. They thought that they were playing against what they call a bot, which is kind of like artificial intelligence software that's playing a game against other players. Um, so, that, that, you know, it, it's, but it's all reactive right now. There's no way to, that the sites haven't developed tools to proactively police that. So it's a matter of a player getting ripped off uh, and then complaining about it. Them doing an investigation, finding out, yep, there's there's something to this, and they may or may not get their money refunded. So, so for me, having a, having a class two product out there that it, it's a, it's a tribe sovereign right to conduct it, have the servers on tribal land, and uh, states aren't going to be able to get any taxation or. Uh, the things that California is trying to do to the tribes of California, all those things go away um, if, if, it, if you can get it to, to, to be conducted legally on your tribal land and, and only on your tribal land. It gets a little dicier when it gets outside of your tribal land because then you're, you know, the precedent's been set by Washington, D.C. and some of the other states that are looking to set up intranets within the jurisdictions that they govern. So it would, have, it would probably have to be the same way for, for tribes, which may limit the effectiveness of uh, internet game, internet gaming, you know, if you only can conduct it on your tribal land, but it's better than nothing. Um, it, it is it is definitely controversial. You know, if, if class two gaming were to be conducted on the internet, you know, what limitations would it have? We we know what what Igris is and what's allowed to be conducted on tribal land. How would that translate into a virtual environment over the internet? <coughs> and how how broad reaching is that? Well, we're going to get into some current regulatory methods that are out there in internet gaming right now. A lot of this is being conducted in, in, in jurisdictions such as Albany, Isle of Man, British Columbia. Um, these, these jurisdictions have put uh, documented um, standards and rules and regulations together for the conduct of internet gaming. Um, one, one subject that's near and dear to our heart is, of course, internet game system verification. How, how do you verify that? What is being operated on the internet has been tested, validated, certified, um, and whatnot. And uh, the internet game system verification is a key function of the overall internet gaming regulatory approach. Um, just like bricks and mortar casinos, Independent testing laboratories can provide expert analysis and testing to ensure that the systems are secure. I mean, we can go through security methods, 
that they meet the requirements there, uh, minimum payout percentages, fairness, randomness, um, software cannot be modified or at least if there's security measures in place to prevent the modification of software without it being um, you know, tagged as, as, as being changed. And then verifying the software being oper that's operated as being approved in some sort of what we now call signatures of the software. Um, and uh, many of the, uh, the currently regulated internet regulatory agencies do have independent testing laboratories test the systems. As I mentioned, we are authorized with the Iowa man. Um, and they have standards that, that we can test to. Uh, then perform the software verification and uh, then perform just like you would opening a casino before it goes live, do another verification, make sure everything's configured correctly uh, before it goes live and try and mitigate uh, any issues that may, may arise at the start of the new next day. Sure, and, and that's like, like Nick said, that's like with any system that you have running in your casino, you want to have that assurance that what's running on the internet in your name, potentially, or as, as your product, um, that has met your technical requirements, whatever they turn out to be someday. You want to make sure that they've been tested to that, and the only way to really to do that, you want to do it independently. You don't want people to think there's been some kind of chicanery going on where uh, the tribe or, or the state has tested it and, and, and worked this thing so it's going to work against the public. Um, that's probably one of the worst things that, that you can have is public perception. When you have an independent laboratory do it, if there's that independence, there's testing it to your standards, it's a public document, everybody knows what the standards are, and you have, there, there's peace of mind for the public, there's peace of mind for you as the regulator. Um, this product is, is the best product you can put forward, there's a way to validate that on site. Another regulatory method we want to talk about is player registration and uh, account management. An area that, that a lot of discussion has gone. Um, on is how, how to actually regulate this and make, make sure it's working correctly and, and in a way that you can enforce the proper procedure. Um, player registration is a, is a key function of the overall gaming approach. A sound regulatory approach uh, ensures that players are of, of the appropriate age to participate. Um, that's a big, big risk factor for gaming. Uh, in the casino, it's easy. You know, you see miners in there, you check their ID, toss them out. Uh, it's not as easy online because they could be using their father's account, and uh, you don't know who actually is running that, that computer uh, with that machine, with that game. Uh, the identity and the location of the player, to a reasonable extent, you're able to find that that information out. Uh, player. The, the, another key part is that the player has to accept terms uh, uh, of play and conditions of gameplay. So they're going to know beforehand what the rules of the game are, who's conducting the, the internet gaming, who's regulated by, that they are going to participate in an appropriate way. They're not going to try and do anything illegal to try and manipulate the game. And if they do, they're going to be held accountable for that. So you get them to sign off that they're gonna participate the right way. That's key, especially if something does happen. I'm sure John as a lawyer can tell you they have, they've signed off the fact that they know these things before they do it, it's a lot easier to prosecute. Um, following our key areas for player registration, uh, identity verification, uh, including their age. So that could be different documents. Um, if, you, if you're having players register in person, there's uh, a number of different ways out there that this is done from across the world. Uh, obviously, in person would mean driver's license, passports, documents, birth certificates, whatever it is that you would require, maybe utility bill for, for address. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the Northern Territory in Australia actually lets people register online and then within 90 days they have to email or fax or mail these types of documents to, to the Gaming Commission so that their accounts can remain active after 90 days. So others just require a credit card, which isn't very effective at all, especially when there's 13 year olds in the United States who have credit cards. <laughs> so. So the identity points that you were pointing out, ah. there, I just wrote them up on the screen for you. Very good. <laughs> now, and, and with the credit card, <coughs> when someone uses a credit card, there are third party 
verification services that can be used that take that person's identity, compare it against their credit history and their criminal uh, records, um, and gives you a reasonable idea of how old they are and their, where, where they live. Yeah, the their address is associated with their credit card account. We can do things like that. But credit card, of course, brings into the controversy of the item, which doesn't permit credit card wagering. This becomes a circular discussion when you start talking about how, how internet gaming in the U.S. looks like uh, with current legislation in UI and proposed legislation to legalize it. Now, it, it's probably important to point out that there are a couple of federal bills that have been floated about. They're in various states of completion. Uh, and they, they're, it's kind of hazy as to how they're going to treat this act. Some are just saying that it's going to soften it. Some are going to say it's going to abolish it. But uh, the, the, the fact that there is no financial transactions with internet gaming, yet Congress does not slap down the Washington, D.C. bill just means you, you wonder what's actually going on there. They are, by being silent with Washington, D.C., by not responding within the 30-day time frame, Congress has said it's okay that for them to have internet gaming. So an act that, they, that Congress has now um, basically approved is illegal at the same time. So it's kind of a, a catch-22, and it's what you said. It's a circular discussion, and it's really leering in the background of everything we're discussing is the fact that banking transactions are illegal right now. Yes. yes. Uh, one of the other things about identity down there on the bottom, players should not be allowed to have aliases or multiple accounts. And what, what this, the reason for that is, as we mentioned, you know, you look at internet poker and collusive activity, bots, things of that nature, a lot of that comes about because players are allowed to have multiple accounts. So they'll log in as as one player at, at, at one site and there's a, another player at another site, or they could be even logged in on multiple, you know, as multiple different players as one person at the same table. Uh, and, and that's where you can kind of get into, you know, some really collusive behavior where, you know, I have four seats at the table under four different aliases and Ken has one. Well, I know four hands in the game. It limits what he can have if I'm, if I'm counting the back. And I definitely have an advantage over him. I'll probably clean him out in a matter of hours. So, um, you know, it, it's that kind of thing that when you're doing this identity verification, you're establishing these accounts um, with internet gaming sites, that you want to be cognizant of what you're allowing players to do to avoid any, any type of misuse of the site. And one other thing about um, player accounts is uh, in Alderney. Um, they, they have, in their um, internal controls, they have a, a, rec a requirement that each operator has to have an ongoing review of those player accounts. So they, a couple times a year, they have to review who their actual patrons are and just make sure that that information is still correct, that nothing's changed, that players who have been banned aren't still uh, enabled, or they've gotten different accounts under a different name. There, there's all kinds of checks and balances that have to go on. If you don't know who your players are, then those kind of things start to reach in. Yes. Yeah, you, you, you have uh, players that have been banned from sites or even self-banned uh, because they think they have a problem. They want to prevent themselves from doing that. They just want you know, create a new account under an assumed name. If you're not doing that identity verification, there's nothing to stop them from doing that. Um, another area, uh, as Ken mentioned, you know, as part of an agreement, for a player to establish an account is for them to accept the terms and conditions on, on your website or on a, on a given website. This, we, we took a quote from the Alter, Alternate Standards here. It says, the terms and conditions should be clear, concise, and understandable so that a customer, having accepted the terms and conditions, can reasonably said to be fully aware of the terms under which they participate. The licensee should avoid using jargon, technical, or legal terminology for these reasons, nested multiple sets of terms and conditions within the same document are not favored unless they are structurally organized <coughs> in a manner that meets the customer's comprehension. The commission will construe complex or ambiguous terms against the operator on the basis of what is likely to be understood. 
So what that's saying there is that your, your, your terms and conditions for your internet gaming site have to be clear and not confusing to your, your patrons, let's say an average person, if you will. And, and if it is not clear, then any disputes are going to be ruled against you for the ambiguity. Yeah, and that, it, it shouldn't read like a software license. You know, you ever trying to read one of those? It's like talking to John. And it's just called legalese. It's just ridiculous. Uh, you can't have that because the player who said they didn't understand or they didn't know what, what that meant. When, when you keep it really literal and, 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 and on a level that everyone can understand, there is no excuse <coughs> that. And that's, that was an interesting area that I saw within the Alderney uh, mix. And this Alderney was the basis for the British Columbia technical standards as well. So it, it really is one of the more well-rounded um, set of um, standards that I've seen out there. We've tried to go through them all, and uh, it's really a good basis if you're looking to do uh, something with, with, with creating internet technical standards. Alberta is a good start through, through internal controls, and British Columbia built the, theirs off of those. So, so a little tip for you. Sure, it's not easy copy and paste, but there's a lot to borrow from that. Yep. Um, some of the terms and conditions, you know, some some things that have to be in them based based upon Alberta's requirement. Customers consent to have the licensee confirm the customer's age, identity, and residence. And okay, we've talked about that already. But now you're saying in your terms and conditions, you know, you have to be of legal age and you have to be verifiable to be in the jurisdiction and all that kind of stuff. Um, the house rules. What are the rules and obligations to put with the customer? You know, not just how the game's played, but also the rules that the customer must abide by to participate in gaming on the website. Disputes and complaints procedure. So if a patron has a dispute, if something happens during a game and, and, and they need to get it resolved, what's the process? Who do they contact? What do they have to provide to, to do that? And then privacy policy, including information access. You know, what are the privacy policies of other websites? Um, standard language on slot machines. Voiding of all plays and pays in the event of a malfunction. Uh, it carries over into internet gaming. Function voids all pays and plays. Common gaming language. And then consequences. If you engage in improper behavior, if you do something that isn't allowed by these terms and conditions, there will be consequences and maybe outline some of those consequences. Yes, and that and that those all right there in addition to a host more are all areas that it, it deters people from uh, doing things that you don't want them to be doing on, on your website or attacking it. Um, okay. Uh, depositing withdrawing funds. This is an area that you know it's uh, controversial, <laughs> especially in the United States. Uh, the United States is actually going out and trying to shut down sites that are not even based in the United States. Well, now that's possible, but they've done it. Um, so once a player is registered, uh, their identity is verified and they have accepted the terms. So all those things are true now. They have an account. They've accepted the terms, now they're able to play. Depositing withdrawing funds becomes the next area to address for the regulatory body. Now, this is also assuming that you're allowing people, you're able to allow people to register online too, to have them sign off on terms. I mean, that could be a physical thing that they do in person as well. Uh, but every time they go to, to play, that's, that, those terms should be signed off on. Um, you know, that's no different than it. most intranets I've ever been involved with with companies. They make you, you know, when you log on to your computer or log on to the network, it's telling you flat out. And that's one of the, the big recommendations from an IT security standpoint is have the user sign off on what, what, what they're doing and what their rights are uh, on the network that they're going on. Same thing with this. So uh, the following are areas to consider when depositing or withdrawing funds. These are some of the not so obvious areas. Um, after verification of the player's identity, deposits can take place at a brick and mortar casino or at an online website utilizing a secure transaction method. Um, se secure transactions online have been pretty pretty secure for the most part over the years. Sure. Um, you know, I suppose anyone could be hacked at any time if they were targeted. I mean, if the Pentagon could get hacked uh, almost weekly by the Chinese, then uh, any commerce site or gambling site could as well. I guess it. Uh, I guess it just matters if they want to or not. We, we were careful to take off the bullet point that said that you know, accounts had to be set up using a credit card, which was a requirement in Alderney. Yeah. But uh, because of UI, I kind of had a discussion about it. So 
Well, we're talking about regulating the internet to a bunch of people that you know reside here in the United States, so we know that that would be an illegal activity to use credit card wagering. So yeah, and, and Alberni as well as a few other places, they just uh, all transactions are on cash. So or no or cash. Not, I'm sorry. You can't. There's no cash. No <laughs> cash. Which you know credit cards and secure bank transactions through a wire or something like that. Sure, and when you're talking about internet gaming, it's highly um, auditable because everything is done electronically. So you have record of who trans who deposited or withdrew funds, who did it, when, what time, what account it came from, what account it went to. Yes, and you know when you're talking about cash, it's less auditable. That um, I suppose when you're, you're coming into a brick and mortar facility, then you have surveillance and you have you know you're checking an ID and things like that, but. It's still cash, and that, that's one of the reasons why they, they, I believe that they banned it from these other countries. Um, but we have the opposite problem here in America. <laughs> so, withdrawals from a player's account on the internet gaming system must be paid directly to an account with a financial institution in the name of the player, or made payable to the player and forwarded to the player's address. Uh, the name and address must be the same as held in the player registration details. So that's how, how a player gets their funds out. Um, it either be directly to a financial institution or delivered to their address. You don't, they don't deal in cash in other places. Whether you decide to do that or not, that's an area that's yet to be explored here in the United States. Paying mm -hmm. players back in cash. I suppose we could because we pay them back cash in every other area of gaming. And if they're going to be required to come into the brick and mortar facility, then that would be something that would be easily done. Um, inactive accounts holding funds that in the internet gaming system must be protected from forms of illicit access or removal. So as, a, as an operator, if you have accounts that are just sitting there for six months, a year, and active, then you have to make sure that those are secure. Those are not susceptible to internal theft or, or from an outside entity, a hacker of some sort. So they should probably be off the, the main network. Okay, reporting. As, as with anything in gaming, we all have to provide reports on activities and various financial and other transaction things that involve security and integrity. So reporting is a key function of the overall gaming regulatory approach. Uh, critical to having information about player accounts, game sessions, game information, and significant events. Uh, the approach to this is um, for each individual player account, the IGS must maintain the player's identity details, including their identity verification results. So if you're using a third party to verify identity and age and things like that, you need to store that information on your system. Their account details with their current balances, changes to their accounts if they, if they, had, if they changed their address, if they got married and changed their name, uh, anything like that. Details of any previous accounts, including if they deactivated the account, what, why they were deactivated. The deactivation could not only be that the player cashed out, but they may have done something wrong and you may have, you know, as an internet gaming operator, you may have deactivated your account and shut it down. Um, so, you know, why was their account deactivated? And then deposit, withdrawal, keeping track of all their transactions, and then their gameplay history. You know, games that they played, the wagers that they made, how much they won, jackpots won, etc. Should there ever be a dispute over an amount paid, You'll have that information. You can replay what they did on, on your website. Well, we're we're um, coming short on time, and we're getting the uh, couple minute warning here. We got ten minutes. <laughs> well, we got to do this up. So um, uh, we did provide a handout to everyone. That, well, to twenty of them. We didn't expect more than twenty, but we got more than twenty, which is a good thing. Um, so we have a handout if you'd like a copy of that that has all this information and more in it. Um, yes, we're not going to be able to get the end of this, but we will try. So, so reporting from a player account, uh, a list of all currently active players. It's important to have who, who your active players are and your in inactive players. We want to have all that information. Your, your system should be able to do that. Um, accounts that are, uh, that are inactive should have, be able to have a report for that. Um, player, players have exceeded a configurable limit for wins or, or, or deposits or what have you, withdrawals, those should be able to be reported. Basic reporting functionality you'd expect on any system, basically. Okay, 
Okay, then you have your game session reports. Um, when you're reporting game sessions, you want to have unique player IDs who was involved in the games, uh, the start and time of the sessions, and then the information about, you know, games played, mouse bet, mouse one, jackpot, things like that, for all the players that may participate in poker or other types of games. And then um, the system has to be able to generate these reports upon request and provide a list of all the currently active gaming sessions, all the sessions that are currently open at any, at any given time. And then you have individual game reporting, uh, which would be like most other games that you've ever encountered. Having a, a unique player um, ID for uh, the game, the game start time, according to the, to the gaming system. How much is wagered, uh, the result, the outcome of that game. That should also be available in history. Uh, the end time, how much was won, any progressives that were involved. All the things that you'd expect on any typical game would be what you'd see on that. If you call this last game recall, I'd like to give you an idea of what this is really talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so much keeping the last 10 games played, because now you're talking about player accounts. So you're keeping track of player events, five player. Yeah, no, that, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> and significant event reporting, uh, changes made by the regulator to parameters of the game should all be tracked. Any progressive changes or any, really any changes to the games at all. If games are changed out, all that's going to be in an unalterable log. Uh, on the system that any regulator should be able to pull off and you should be doing daily audits of that. Maybe not daily, but weekly or however you structure it. Then the game requirements, how the games are, are you know, game requirements are fundamental to, to internet gaming. Um, functionality is similar to many casino games, um, but as far as game design goes, you, the scenario that's different from traditional gaming uh, all critical functions, including generation of outcome of any game and resulting percent payout, must be generated by the internet game system independently of the employer device, employer device being the computer where the players are interacting. And then um, the game outcome determination must not be affected by the effect of bandwidth, link utilization, bit error, or any other characteristics of the communications channel between the internet gaming system and the employer device. So here you're talking about communication between the computer system and someone's house and the system, and how that, how that game has to you know, maintain its integrity, regardless of you know, if that player's internet provider goes down. Cat steps on the keyboard. Cat steps on the Somebody keyboard. fat fingers the screen and closes out the game before it stops. You know, yeah. Things like that are things that we never had to encounter before. Those are the areas that really are unique, and we're getting the curtains call. Kill it call. Kill it call. In the back, so we appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we hope you got something from this presentation. Again, if you would like a copy of this presentation and or the handout, uh, just let us know and we'll get that to you. So we appreciate your time. Thank you.